have the pleasure of speaking with you about the Strategic Communication and Public Relations Center, which is, I think, based on what I've heard so far this morning, the third oldest of the centers. We were founded back in, not that age matters, uh, founded back in uh, 2001 and launched in 2002. It came out of a discussion with, uh, with former Dean Jeff Cowan. And w the mission of this center is to advance the study, practice, and value of the public relations and strategic communication function, in effect serving as a think tank for the, for the field, which is, all of you know, I think, is, is changing at an incredibly fast, fast pace. Uh, we want to try to bridge the academic professional gap, which traditionally has been huge. Traditionally, academics haven't really talked to practitioners in my field. Drive our bachelor's curriculum and our master's curriculum through the kind of data that we gather. We've reviewed both of those curricula in recent years, and the research we've done through the center has been a, played a major role in how we've updated those. But perhaps uh, most importantly, uh, a part of our mission is to position the Annenberg School as a center of thought leadership in this field. So we're a little bit different from some of the other centers. We don't so much produce product, although we do some really interesting research. We're really about, in, in part, branding the Annenberg School as being a leader in this field. We've had a lot of great partners over the years, folks who have provided various amounts of money, uh, ranging from about a buck and a half to $25,000 or $50,000. Most recently, Edelman, the Global Public Relations Agency, uh, provided us with a $25,000 grant, which was a great help in launching the GAP-8 study that I'll tell you about in just a minute. Here you see the team. Uh, my colleagues, Professors Berghard Tendrich and Kirsten Thorson, uh, along with yours truly. Uh, two young women, I don't think either of them is here, we call them the Emilys, uh, Emily G and Emily Savastano, two brilliant, soon to graduate students in the Masters in Strategic Public Relations. Uh, and we've been working in consultation with a couple of gentlemen who let's just think of them as being outside consultants and, and advisors, very well known within the field. Now, our cornerstone project has been the generally accepted pra uh, practices study, or the GAP study. This emerged from yet another discussion that I had with uh, a former, uh, an alum of ours, Steve Harris, who was then chief communications officer on a global level for General Motors, and he said, um, you know, we don't even have any way to logically build our budget every year because there are no guidelines, there are no benchmarks, there are no parameters. There's a real need for this kind of foundational data to help practitioners guide what they do, to which I thought, well, we can solve that problem. That's not, that's not that big a challenge. So out of that came the GAP study, the Generally Accepted Practices Study. And you can see here listed all of the things we try to do with it, keep ahead of what's going on, inform practitioners about what they need to be doing as the world changes around them, how they need to organize their functions, so on and so forth. But again, you see down at the bottom, we use GAP as a tool to establish ASCJ as a center of thought leadership with multiple audiences. So when we do this study, it's of importance to a whole lot of different people. It's of importance, one of the things that's really gratifying is that it's important to our students because we share the data with them, we bring it into our classes, and they can find out what's happening in, the, in, in real time in our field. It's effective with prospective students. It's, it's effective with um, the academy. We have researchers from throughout the world turning, and turning to our study uh, for data. And we have practitioners who come to us all the time and say, we rely very heavily on the GAP study as we, begin, as we plan uh, for the future. Here you see a little bit about the history we've just completed. We've just completed the fielding of GAP-8. Uh, we're going to publish in, in April of this year. But in thinking about GAP-8, we decided that we wanted to take a fresh look at this entire project and not necessarily just keep doing the same things that we were doing all, uh, all along. We had, we've done a pretty good job, we think, of establishing it as kind of the go-to source. People say all the time when we're, when we're at professional conferences and so forth, oh yeah, we turn to GAP all the time for, for data on how we should be building, managing our functions and so forth. And I don't think they say that, Bruce, only because I've paid for dinner. I think there are actually other reasons for their saying that. But the question then became, so what happens next? All right, we've done this, we need to maintain that for sure, but now what happens? We felt that we need to get beyond the tactical and observational, explore the evolving role of communication and the CCO, the Chief Communication Officer, 
explore the organizational, social, and technological dynamics that are driving change in our field, many of which are the same things that are driving change in the field of journalism, too. Explore the implications of all that for the academy and the practice. Identify true best practices. The term best practice gets thrown around all too loosely. There's a big difference between something that is done frequently and commonly and something that is truly best. To be best, it has to be proven. So we thought that's something we could focus on. We want to encourage further uh, research by uh, sharing data. And as it says here in italics, we saw a huge opportunity international because what we had been able to do within the United States, it was not being done elsewhere in the world with the possible exception of Europe. So we saw an international opportunity. The way we've addressed that is by partnering with the single organization that represents the, the strategic communication and PR function globally. That's the Global Alliance of Public Relations and Communication Management, which to give you an idea of how global they are, they, their membership consists of the trade associations and leading academic institutions in all of these countries. So they're pretty much everywhere. And um, the model that we've come up with in working with the Global Alliance is, uh, is, is aimed at establishing the first global framework for the ongoing study of this discipline. It's being done on a country by country basis in a bunch of places, primarily in Europe and certainly in the, in the United States through GAP, but there is no global framework. Nobody's watching what's happening globally, internationally, and all that. That's the opportunity. And at the same time, we felt we could support and enhance research in individual countries. Methodology is fairly simple. We've partnered now with in institutions in five other countries, and through they're using our expertise with GAP to implement similar studies in their own countries. Um, the local partner's role is to contribute uh, to, let's say, we, we went through a consensus process in developing an instrument, a questionnaire that could apply on a global basis. Uh, so they then, they, they work with us on that. They then have to localize the questionnaire, adding questions that are of relevance to their countries. They have to field the study and they have to analyze their own in-country results. So that's the, that's the role of the in-country partners. Then our role is to provide guidance, counsel. We've provided them with our code book. We, we wrote a handbook, a GAP handbook, that they're all using and thinking about how to devise their own in-country studies. And once they're all done, and they're all in the field now, by the way, once they're all done, it becomes our responsibility to integrate the data from the different countries and analyze it on a cross-country basis. Really a pretty fascinating kind of, kind of uh, project. Here you see the participants in this pilot study. And it's a really interesting group. You can see Australia, University of Tech in Sydney and, and their uh, professional association, Brazil, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, and of course the United States ourselves with the GAP study. And I think the New Zealanders wanted in once they heard the Australians were in. It's like we couldn't proceed without getting then the New Zealand involved too. They, there would have been a war between the two of them. What happens next with all of this? As I say, we're currently in the field. We're currently in the field in all of these countries. The results will be announced, the collective uh, results will be announced at the World Public Relations Forum in Madrid in September. We're gonna then revise our approach as needed and we're going to roll out phase two, which means additional countries probably like India, China, um, and probably another South American country, maybe Venezuela, and then continue to build continue to build until we ultimately have true global representation in this process. So that's one of our major undertakings right now. At the same time we're working on that, we've just completed the GAP-8 study here in the United States. It was shut down about, I don't know, six or seven weeks ago, so now it's time to analyze. We haven't done a lot of the analysis yet, but I wanted to share with you this morning, this is the first time anybody's gonna hear this, so I hope you're all really excited. Um, I can share with you some headlines from the GAP study, and please understand that these, these headlines are really based on very limited analysis to date, okay? Um, as I said, we wanted to take a fresh look, and we looked at all of these issues as we considered the design of GAP-8. We've added a couple of interesting things. Uh, the third bullet down I'm particularly pleased about, we've added a qualitative element 
to what has been a purely quantitative study. This qualitative element involves a special class taught by Professor Thorson in which 10 students are actually conducting in-depth interviews with people who responded to the GAP study, drilling down on why their organizations stand out in some way. Why do they seem to be more successful? That'll give us a lot more stuff to work with from a research and publication standpoint. We're gonna build an online database where you can just go in and query a few things and get the data you want. On the publication side of it, uh, we included in GAP-8 in the questionnaire questions specific to the expertise of two of our new colleagues, um, Darren Brabham and I Mei Yang, and they're gonna be doing some papers now based on the results from GAP uh, that focus on their areas of interest. Uh, analysis, we're going to focus on, to a greater extent on social, organizational, technological issue, uh, issues. But as you can see, all of this is going to continue to reinforce that kind of go-to center of thought leadership positioning that we've been looking for. Part of that positioning has to do with credibility. My field is public relations and communications, branding, all that sort of thing. We understand that credibility is very important to our brand. One way to enhance credibility is by associating with third party industry leaders. These are the four major professional groups in our world. The Arthur W. Page Society, the Institute for PR, IABC and PRSA. All four of those groups have partnered with us to help GAP be successful. So that association goes a long way toward helping us maximize participation in GAP and enhancing the credibility of the, of the study, which is very important. Um, quickly on the methodology, we had more than 1,000 responses, 582 passed a really rigorous screening process we put them through uh, to see how really senior they were because we only wanted to hear from the most senior level practitioners working in corporations, nonprofits, and government agencies. 347 people answered all 50 of our questions which is pretty significant. That's a lot of people to sit there, think about it. How long does it take to do 300, uh, to do 50 questions? So we're pretty pleased with the results. This gives you a quick look at how they're distributed among types of organizations, um, public companies and private companies making up 52% uh, of our respondents, the rest split between nonprofit government agency and others. Geographic scope, the blue is US local and regional, 36%, US national, 19%. Global is purple, meaning home country plus uh, four or more other countries. Multinational uh, is your home com country plus up to four other countries. So it's good distribution. Academic degrees, thought you might find this interesting. 80% um, of our respondents have an academic degree in either journalism, PR, or communication. So people have talked for a long while about people from other fields, from business and so forth coming into the field. That doesn't seem to be happening yet at the top ranks of the communications field. Might sometime soon, but I don't, uh, I don't think so. One of the core issues that we cover each year, uh, each time we do GAP, is budgets, because if you're the head of communications for a major organization, one of the things you're really interested in how, is how much you should be budgeting. The key here, the key takeaway is, notice as you move your eyes from left to right, that the bars continue to go up. Okay, so uh, we're seeing here growth from 2011 to 2013 in budgets dedicated to what we think of as corporate communications and public relations. This excludes stuff like product advertising, which is a lot more expensive, okay? That big number on the end, 55 million, may be an anomaly, a slight anomaly due to this particular sample, but I think the important point is the trend line that you see going up, 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 up is unavoidable. That's clearly what's happening. It's an indication of the extent to which our field is growing, which is great. How do they allocate their budgets? 40% go to staff salaries and related. For me, the most exciting thing is that second low bar, this thing here, it looks low, 6% for measurement and evaluation. That was 3% not long ago. So the point is that the percentage of budgets allocated to measurement and evaluation is going up and it's staying pretty stable at a higher level. Um, Couple of things, oh, we created a tool called the PRGR relationship, which talks about given your gross revenue, your big company, your General Motors, how much would you spend on public relations slash strategic communication? We created this thing called the PRGR ratio and have found out, and this has remained consistent over several studies now, 
Large companies on average spend between 0.04% and 0.06% of gross revenue on public relations and strategic communications. It sounds small, but think about these big companies. These are like $50 billion companies and larger. So it adds up pretty quickly. Uh, just a quick sampling of some of the responsibilities that people in the field have focusing on social. Take a look on the far right column at the percentage changes and your eye will immediately be drawn to those that are kind of changing rapidly, growing rapidly. Issues management. This is different from crisis management. Issues management is the monitoring of what's going on out there in the world and helping prepare the organization before something goes off the rails. This is being enabled by social media, we think, and use of digital and online metrics to track what's happening. Multimedia production. I think there are some PR students in the room. I think Kate Jacobs, 351A classes here, is that right? Welcome, it's good to see you. Pay close attention to these, okay? This is where the opportunities are. Multimedia production is growing like crazy. Social media participation is growing like crazy. People, and when, when organizations are responding to what's being said on social media, we're the ones who are doing it. So we need to understand the dynamics of all of that. And so on. Customer relations has been growing like crazy. The PR strategic comm function was never before involved in customer relations to any great degree. Social media has changed all of that. So there are huge opportunities we're seeing here, all of which have enormous ramifications for the, tr for the practice, for the way we run our programs, for the way we help senior professionals rethink their own functions. Quick look at what's been discussed a couple of times, but not specifically in these terms. Facebook, Facebook versus Twitter. We asked people, tell us about the extent on a one to seven scale of how extensively you use these tools. Notice the flip flop. 2011, Facebook 475, Twitter 433. 2013, just the reverse. Something's going on here. We keep talking about, people keep talking about how maybe Facebook is losing favorability in some ways. We hear it, you know, maybe younger people aren't using it as much. Does this suggest that Twitter is rising in importance among the corporate world and not just among young people relative to Facebook? Interesting to watch what happens. Uh, some tools that we now think are core, we asked again folks, one to seven scale, frequency with which you use each of these tools. I don't think Henry Jenkins is here, which is too bad. But if there are any Henry Jenkins fans here, notice that spreadable content is the number one, one to seven scale, the number one in terms of the ranking of the frequently used tools within the practice. I can't guarantee that all of our respondents know what spreadable media is, what spreadable content is, but I strongly suspect that they, you know, it's a pretty self-explanatory kind of ter tool, term rather, so I suspect they probably do get it. And you can see how the rest of them fall on down the line. That, one, that last one, by the way, online editorial websites, this is one that my friends in journalism sometimes cringe at. Increasingly, companies of all types are hiring senior level journalists who are in effect publishing online trade publications for those companies. Cisco Systems is doing it, several others are doing it, whole new different thing. Some call it corporate journalism, some call it online editorial, whatever, it's a new, new tool. Who's in charge of digital and social tools? We found over the last several gap studies that it's the PR stratcom people who are responsible, not the marketing people. Now, the, 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 the weakness here is that these are self-reported results. So it's the PR com people saying, we're the ones in charge. But the data is pretty compelling because it's remained consistent year over year. And look at the gap, 72% versus 43%. Again, one to seven scale, degree of control over social media, I think there's a picture emerging here. And the reason for that, well, we could talk about that all day, but we won't, okay? Measurement and evaluation tools. This lists the top 10 tools, one to seven scale, frequency of use. The bummer that this slide conveys is that none of them are much over five. One to seven scale, the top one is 5.01. What does that tell us? It tells us that people have little or no faith in the tools available to them. So they're not supporting any of them to any great degree. This is something we need to focus on and we are focusing on. Quickly, looking at uh, types of agency relationships, all you have to see is this and this. 
The far left one talks about agency of record, which means we work with one agency. The right one, we work with multiple agencies. Agency of record is out the window. It used to be the bread and butter of the agency industry. It no longer is. Average client today works with 4.8 agencies, not one. Think about the economics of that. Agency relationships, here's good news for the agencies. For the first time since we started doing GAP, something other than additional arms and legs is ranked as the number one reason for working with agencies. That is a significant change. And it says a great deal about the way the agencies need to conduct themselves. Number three, objective independent counsel. Number four, strategic insight. These are good, powerful things. And I'll skip that, I'm gonna skip that, I'm gonna skip that. Best practices, I'll get to you in a second. Integration is really important. PR people need to champion organizational integration, which means a whole different skill set on the part of chief communications officers. Measurement and evaluation must be emphasized, which means we must understand data, analytics of all types. Three, culture and character. We've got to be flexible, forward thinking, um, uh, uh, and so forth. That demands that we be authentic, data-driven, anticipatory, strategic, real-time, and long-term, and so forth. You get the picture. What's happening here is that the field is changing as we stand or sit in this room, and it's changing very, very quickly. And the students have the advantage of being able to take advantage of the real-time learning that we're now doing that is finding its way into our curriculum. Thank you very much. You had a question? Yeah. Can you like evaluate, can yeah. You on that? Like yeah. What used to happen, and what still does happen in, in, to a large extent, is that if a corporation finds itself with a big challenge ahead of it or a big project, it will hire an agency simply to increase the body count, simply to increase the number of people available to work on it. There's no intellectual added value there at all. It's strictly labor. That was, until now, the number one reason. Now it's changed. Yeah. Uh, you said the, the next, the SCAP report will be published in September? No, it'll be published in April. Oh, April. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Because uh, I know there's such a huge gap between the last one and this one regarding a number of different areas that people were utilizing. And I, uh, so some of that data is already out of date, so to speak. Yep. We started out doing it every year. Then we found that the data weren't changing that much from year to year. So we went to every other year. So we'll publish this one April of this year. The last one was published April two years ago. Now, if I wanted to try to do some research on that before it is published, where can I find some of that information? Send me an email. Okay. <laughs> Swirling at usc.edu. Got it. Okay. Other questions? No? Thank you.